10 minutes, at five minutes, be at five minutes before the end of, uh, of your talk. And at the end, I will verbally signal the time is up. So each speaker will have, uh, the keynote speakers and respondents will have 10 minutes at the end uh, to field question from, from the audience. Um, so important just to make sure um, that you are registered for, um, that you are registered so that you can receive your CD, CPD points and kindly ensure that your name your and your surname uh, on the Zoom link are accurate. And this is for the CPD, uh, CPD purposes. All right, I think um, we're a little bit ahead of, uh, ahead of time, uh, which is good. And I am now going to hand over to uh, our first keynote speaker, uh, Andre Lightman. Good morning, everyone. Um, I pre-recorded my, my presentation, so I'm going to ask if the uh, if Nikita can can play that for us now. Good morning, everybody. Let me begin by thanking the conveners of the symposium for the invitation to participate in this morning's event. Back in 2019, when Drs. Wendy Fuchel and Rene Nassen first contacted me with regard to my research into the life of Dr. Vera Birman, I could not have imagined that it would lead to an event of this nature. So again, thank you for the invitation. By way of background, let me go back to that first meeting with the two doctors in 2019. They had been involved for some time in a project investigating the history of child psychiatry in South Africa. As part of their research into child psychiatry in the Western Cape, they interviewed the late Professor Lynn Gillis. During their interview, Professor Gillis referred to Dr. Vera Birman's involvement in the early history of child psychiatry in the Western Cape. He also mentioned the fact that she had been sent to Germany to, as he put it, collect the children of SS German soldiers who were killed. Now, the two doctors were aware vaguely that Vera had done some work with orphans after the war, but they were unclear about the SS connection. When pressed, Professor Gillis declined to elaborate. He suggested to the two doctors that they should visit the UCT Library Special Collections Department, where both his and Dr. Birman's papers were housed. The two psychiatrists then went and visited UCT libraries, but they did not find the answers that they were looking for, at least not all of them. However, they learned from one of the archivists that I was writing a biographical account of Dr. Birman's life as a history master's thesis. And that is how our paths crossed. When we met, I was able to fill them in on what Professor Gillis had hinted at. And that is what generated their interest in the story of Dr. Birman and how it might serve as a case study within a larger conversation around transformation with institutions and other related issues. And so my role this morning, as I see it, is much the same as it was when I first met Wendy and Rene back in 2019. My role is essentially to tell today's audience what I told them then. 
So this morning, I'm going to report briefly on some aspects of the story of Dr. Vera Birman that emerged as my research into the life of this remarkable and unusual woman unfolded. Let me quickly run through a brief biographical summary. Marcia Vera Birman was born in 1910 on the family farm near Ermelo. The name Marcia was dropped very early and she was known throughout her life as Vera. Even though she married, she always signed her name in her professional cap uh, capacity as M. Vera Birman. Despite all odds, this Afrikaner farm girl from Ermelo graduated from UCT's medical school in 1935. She obtained a diploma in public health from Witz in 1943. Between 1936 and 1946, she practiced medicine as a railway doctor in Dalmas, at an asylum, Fort Napier, just outside Peter Maritzburg, and in Springs before she settled in Pretoria, where she was employed by the Pretoria Town Council as medical officer in charge of maternal and child welfare until 1956. But she spent most of the 1950s in the United Kingdom. She first pursued a diploma in psychiatric medicine in 19, 1954 and 1955, and later she trained as a child psychiatrist and a Jungian psychotherapist, and that was from 1957 to 1959. She returned to South Africa in late 1959, and the Union Medical Authorities insisted that she had to do a one-year internship at a psychiatric facility in order for her specializations to be recognized. She chose to fulfill this obligation at Falkenberg in 1960. Her association with UCT began in 1961, and by 1970, she had risen to senior lecturer and senior psychiatrist, and she remained associated with UCT throughout the rest of her professional life. In 1975, at age 65, she began what a colleague of hers referred to as a second professional life, when she became involved in a cross-cultural research project with a causa healer, Mr. Mongezi Tiso, a project that occupied her for the rest of her productive life and brought her a measure of acclaim, both locally and internationally. In the mid-1980s, she was the prime mover behind the establishment of the Cape of Good Hope Center for Jungian Studies, the first Jungian training center on the African continent, and of course from that sprang the current Southern African Association of Jungian Analysts. In 1990, in her 80th year, UCT bestowed an honorary Doctor of Medicine's degree on her, cementing her academic and professional status. She died in 1998 at the age of 88. Now, I'd never heard of Dr. Vera Birman until I took up a position as archivist in the Special Collections Department of UCT Libraries in January 2007. As I said, a collection of her papers is housed there. As an archivist, I worked in a warehouse full of stories, and I have long wanted to tell some of these stories. And I selected Vera's story because as I learned more about her over the years, I began to understand why she was regarded as a pioneer in many fields. And that word, pioneer, was a motif that was used by many people as they described or wrote about her. From her papers and my wider reading, I learned of her pioneering work with autistic children beginning in the 1960s. I learned of the cross-cultural psychiatry research that she undertook in the 70s and 80s in what was then the Siskai, a homeland, as they were known. I discovered that during the mid-1980s, she was the prime mover behind the establishment of the Cape of Good Hope Center, along with other prominent and well-known figures like Sir Lawrence van der Post and Dr. Ian Player, the renowned conservationist credited with saving the white rhino from extinction. And as a result of all these activities, which spanned the 1960s through the mid-1980s, uh, even into the late 1980s, UCT bestowed on her the honorary doctor of medicine's degree that I referred to earlier in 1990. 
It was these achievements that first piqued my curiosity and convinced me that this was a remarkable story that needed to be told to a wider audience. What also piqued my curiosity was that this was an Africana woman. In her book, Sitting Pretty, Christy van der Vestesen writes of the many Africana women in post-apartheid South Africa who are seeking, as she says, to rescue their identities from the moral abyss that apartheid and its official ending tipped them into and to re-infuse their selves with moral worth. It struck me that Dr. Vera Birman might be a role model for this generation of Afrikaners. This was strengthened when my reading began to reveal a trope other than that of pioneer that was frequently used of her. And that was the notion that this Afrikaner woman had managed to tra transcend her Afrikaner nationalistic background and become an exemplar of racial to tolerance. I encountered this trope, this motif, in many forms and in many contexts, but I think it is best summed up by the statement that Manton Hurst made when he wrote in 2007, racism of whatever sort should have no place in the new democratic South Africa. We are reminded of Vera Birman's ability to transcend her own cultural background with its Osavar Brandbach and nationalistic Afrikaner connections and her enthusiasm for embracing otherness. It is an example we all should emulate." End quote. And so I wanted to investigate the story of this pioneering Afrikaner woman because it seemed to me that she could be a role model to all of us, not only because she had achieved a great deal professionally, as evidenced by the honorary degree and the many other tributes that she received, but because she had apparently undergone a political transformation, a volt fast, in the words of Hearst, she had transcended her Afrikaner nationalistic roots and her Osava Brandwach and other connections. But what were these Osava Brandwach and Afrikaner nationalist roots that he spoke of? What form did her nationalism take? Afrikaner nationalism was not a monolithic phenomenon. It took many forms. What form did Vera's take? How deep did these roots go? So the first thing I needed to do was to determine exactly what Dr. Vera Birman's nationalistic past entailed. Now the papers that are housed at UCT cover mainly the period from 1960 to the end of her life and they contain almost nothing that addresses what Hearst referred to as her Osava Brandwach and Afrikaner nationalist connections. And there is nothing in those papers about the German orphans that Professor Gillis had alluded to. In fact, all of her CVs pretty much gloss over the period in 1948 when she was in Germany. So to piece it all together, I had to access other archival sources and a wide range of secondary sources. Some of these archival sources are held at the University of the Northwest, the Osava Brandfach Archive, some at the Heritage Foundation, some at the National Archives in Pretoria, uh, particularly the Ditsa Kinderfonds Archive. And in addition to those archival sources, I had to consult widely in both English and Afrikaans literature. What emerged from my investigation was that beginning in 1940, Dr. Vera Birman aligned herself very closely with two Afrikaner nationalist organizations that were part of the extreme radical right, the Osava Brandwach and the Ditsa Kinderfonds. So allow me briefly to expound upon the nature of these two organizations and her role in them in order to demonstrate the full nature and extent of the political views she housed, she espoused, views that she is said to have transcended in later life. First then, Vera Birman and the Osava Brandwach. The Osava Brandwach belongs now to a distant era of Afrikaner history, so a brief explanation is in order, I think. In 1938, the Afrikaner community celebrated the centenary of the Great Trek. Ox wagons crisscrossed the country, Afrikaners dressed 
And this was an exclusively Afrikaner celebration. Afrikaners dressed in Fortreka regalia and they reenacted many of the events and things that had uh, happened during the Great Trek and the customs that were followed. The celebration culminated with all, all the wagons and about 60,000 people gathered uh, in Pretoria on the site of what would become the Fortreka Monument on the 16th of December, a very significant day in the Afrikaner calendar. Now this celebration kindled a spirit of nationalistic euphoria among Afrikaners. And it was out of this euphoria that the Osava Brandwach was born early in 1939. Initially, it was intended to be a cultural organization to keep that euphoria, that spirit of nationalism alive in the Afrikaner community. At its height, it claimed between three and 400,000 members. So it was a mass movement. But in September 1939, the Second World War broke out, and this event dramatically altered the nature of the Osava Brandwach. Many Afrikaners were vehemently opposed to South Africa's involvement in the imperialist war. Some because they hated the British, some because they were Germanophiles, others were both. So when the Union government entered the war on the side of the Allies, to use the words of one Osava Brandwach writer, a fire was lit in a dry felt. This was the era of the shirts movements, the gray shirts, the brown shirts, the black shirts, but it was really the Osova Brandwach that became the natural home of many of the Afrikaner dissidents who were opposed to the war. So the Osova Brandwach very quickly changed from a cultural organization to a extra parliamentary paramilitary opposition movement. There's no doubt that many of its members were ardent admirers of the German people generally, and many of its members and leaders were ardent admirers of Hitler and of National Socialism and wanted to see it adapted or adopted in South Africa. The Osova Brandwach pinned its hope on a German, its hopes on a German victory, because they thought that in the new German order after the war, they would be allowed to establish the longed for authoritarian state. But of course, Germany lost the war and the Osova Brandwach lost its folk start. It became more and more irrelevant in the post-war years, especially when the, narrow, the, the National Party won the 1948 election. By the early 1950s, the Osova Brandwach had completely disbanded, although many of its policies and some of its leaders like BJ Foster were later incorporated into the National Party structures. So how do women, and specifically Dr. Vera Birman, fit into this picture? In general, the Osova Brandwach was a stereotypically gendered, extreme patriarchal organization. Biology dictated that men did the ruling and the fighting and the money making, while the woman could best serve the nation, the folk within the family, raising the children, raising funds, ensuring that the folk remained pure from racial contamination. Motherhood and the folk were inextricably linked. Despite their limited political agency, though, a woman's division was established in support of the male structures, and it is here that Dr. Vera Birman played a prominent role. Documents held in the Osova Brandwach archive revealed that in 1941, Wolf Commandant, Chief Commander, Dr. M. V. Birman, was a member of the Women's Auxiliary Council for the Eastern Transvaal. And in 1946, a year after the war had ended, she was serving on the Women's Executive Council of the Transvaal region. Now, an important event in the Osova Brandwach calendar was the Women's Camp, a Frohalar Trek, that was organized annually within each region. These were military style camps that lasted several weeks. Uh, and during these camps, Diskindachas, experts, would lecture the gathered woman on various subjects. Now, most of the experts were males, as one would expect, but a frequent name that appears on the programs of these camps was Dr. Vera Birman. 
1942, for example, she delivered lectures, several lectures on the influence of wife and mother on the future of child and nation, on sexually transmitted diseases on the soul or the psyche of woman, her strengths and weaknesses, and so on. Uh, in 1943, she lectured on nervous disorders at one of the camps, and some of these lectures still survive. It is not surprising that Vera Birman joined the Osova Brandfach. As I said, it was a mass movement, and almost every patriotic Afrikaner joined at some stage. But what is significant is her level of involvement and the fact that she remained a loyal member right until the end. Even after 1948, when it became apparent that the Osova Brandfach was irrelevant and had lost its meaning, she remained loyal to Hans van Rensburg and to the organization. So the evidence that I found was that Dr. Vera Birman was no ordinary member of a cultural organization. She was a high-ranking officer in this militant extra-parliamentary opposition faction that had strong nationalist socialist leanings. As a Deskundige, she was entrusted with the education of the Volksmutters, the, mother of the, the mothers of the nation. She would have, to be so trusted, she would have had to endorse all of the Osova Brandfach's ideology, including its vision of an authoritarian state, including its exclusionary race policy with its emphasis on biological, economic, and territorial segregation, its highly gendered family, family policy, and I think most significantly, given her medical training, its health policy with its eugenic overtones and obsessive emphasis on what J.M. Kutsia called blood mixing. In the early 90s, J.M. Kutsia published an article titled The Mind of Apartheid. It was about Jeff Cronier. In the 1940s, Jeff Cronier was a leading member of the Osova Brandfach and a prolific writer, obsessed with the notion of blood purity. And many of his writings later on uh, became the foundation for apartheid laws prohibiting mixed marriages and mixed areas and so on. In the 1940s, he was Dr. Vera Birman's commanding officer and the author of the health policy that she would have subscribed to. But let me go on now from the Osova Brandwach to Dr. Vera Birman's involvement in the Ditze Kinderfonds, an organization created by the radical right for a very specific purpose. And it is here that we come to the enigmatic hints that Professor Gillis dropped about SS German soldiers, orphaned children, when Wendy and Rene interviewed him, which so aroused their interest. The story begins in 1945, a few months after the war had ended. 18 influ influential Afrikaners, all of them sympathetic to Germany, and all of them members of either Oswald Piro's New Order or the Osova Brandfach, got together in Pretoria to discuss a plan to bring as many as 10,000 German war orphans to South Africa to be adopted by Afrikaner families. Two of Vera's brothers were present at that first meeting. An organization known as the Ditze Kinderfonds was established to manage this mission. And one of Vera's brothers was elected to the management committee, a post he held until his death in 1961. Now, in essence, the plan was to bring as many German war orphans to South Africa as possible and to have them adopted by Afrikaner families who would ensure that the orphans were raised as true Afrikaners. So total assimilation was the goal. So to that end, funds were raised, support was garnered from leading figures and organizations, including the main Afrikaner churches, and prospective parents were rigorously screened and recruited. Now, at first, the Smuts government was opposed to the scheme. Despite that, the Kinder, the Ditsa Kinderfonds kept lobbying the government, and eventually in 1947, the Union government relented, but they said that the Ditsa Kinderfonds would only be allowed to bring 100 children back from Germany. Despite this drastic reduction from 10,000 to 100, the Ditsa Kinderfonds decided to go ahead with this adoption scheme. 
So it was the Dr. Vera Birman's role in this grandiose plan. <clears throat> now, an important concession that the Smuts government made was to allow the Ditsa Kinderfonds to have its own doctor make the selection of the children. The only restriction the government imposed was that the children had to be mentally and physically healthy. In October 1947, Dr. Vera Birman informed the Ditsa Kinderfonds that she was willing to go to Germany to perform the medical selection of the children. Now, her volunteering for this task was a godsend because the Ditsa Kinderfonds wanted a very particular type of child. The child had to be an orphan, both parents deceased, between the ages of two and eight, preferably a girl because most parents, prospective parents wanted a girl. And the child had to be of demonstrably German and Protestant descent. The DKF, in the words of one historian, wanted master race children. Vera Birman's background in maternity clinics and welfare work, along with her Osava Brandfach pedigree and connections, made her an ideal candidate for this task. Not only was she qualified to assess the children's physical and emotional state, she also understood the type of child that was desired and why. So from January to June 1948, Dr. Birman headed the selection committee that screened and recruited uh, adoptive parents. Applications from Jews, English speakers, or members of any church other than the three major Afrikaans churches were summarily rejected. On 14 June 1948, she left South Africa and met up with Skalk Buerta, the secretary of the Ditsa Kinderfonds in London. Ironically, it was the hated Victor, the British army, whose help was enlisted to enable them to find suitable children in the British sector. A week later, they arrived in Hamburg under the British flag to begin the task of selecting the German children. Now, Dr. Birman has not left a written record of her experiences in Germany. There is no mention of this expedition in any of the papers at UCT. Her reports in the Ditsa Kinderfonds collection at the National Archives in Pretoria are formal and factual, but one letter addressed to her brother Willem is more personal and gives us some insight into her experience, and I'm going to read a fairly lengthy quote to illustrate this. She writes, at Hamburg yesterday, I did the final selection and everything was arranged so brilliantly by the Germans that I was profoundly impressed by the duty we have to them and to the children they have given to us. I don't know if all the experiences here have made me sentimental, but the little dramas that were enacted here yesterday made a deep impression on me. In some cases, both parents or only a mother or a father gave up a child. And in other cases, it was older children who asked very movingly that we must please adopt them." End of quote. As I stated previously, the Ditsa Kinderfonds had stipulated that the ideal child needed to be a full orphan between the ages of three and eight. When it became apparent that very few of the available children met these criteria, uh, Dr. Birman and Skalk Buerta took it upon themselves to go beyond the parameters set up by the organization. And they selected a number of children as young as two and as old as 13 to make up the quota of the 100. And of course, many of these children were not orphans. They ran into many obstacles from local authorities while they were in Germany, from religious and welfare groups, from reporters who accused them of not only having plundered Germany, but now they were stealing their children as well, and so on. But they persisted. The tide turned when they persuaded a leading politician, Wilhelm Kaba, to intervene on their behalf. But even with his endorsement, they could only find 79 suitable children. The 79 children, nine chaperones, and the Ditsa, Ditsa Kinderfonds team traveled back to South Africa aboard the Winchester Castle. 
On the 10th of September, 1948, they embarked, they disembarked at Cape Town and those children who had been uh, assigned to Cape based families were immediately placed with them and the rest made their way to Pretoria by train. By the 25th of September, the last child had been handed over to their new parents. And a few weeks later, Dr. Vera Birman left South Africa for the United States where she was to spend a year doing research. But that was not the end of Dr. Vera Birman's association with the Ditsa Kinderfonds. In 1951, she visited more than 30 of the adoptive families and expressed satisfaction at the level of her Afrikaansung, the Afrikaanerization that she encountered among the children. She advocated that no reunions be held for many more years, lest the children be reminded that they were not Afrikaners and that they would not be tempted to investigate their roots. As had been the case with the Osava Brandtwach, Vera remained a member of the Ditsa Kinderfonds until it disbanded in 1973. In other words, for 25 years after the 1948 trip to Germany, she remained a member involved with the Ditsa Kinderfonds. In broad strokes, then, this is the story of the SS orphans, or more accurately, the German children that Professor Gillis had alluded to. Let me at this point make some remarks that might explain something of the afterlife of that mission uh, and which might also shed some light on why he chose to avoid the subject when he was pressed about it. In large measure, from the beginning, the expedition was lauded in Afrikaans circles. It was presented as an act of humanitarian kindness. It was legitimized by the fact that the newly elected premier, Dr. D.F. Malan, adopted one of the children himself. Pictures of the little blonde girl with the usually dour looking politician, uh, who was, he was so clearly enchanted by the little girl, uh, adorned many a newspaper. As one commentator noted, had the Ditsa Kinderfonds succeeded in bringing 10,000 children, it would have gone down as one of the greatest moments in Africana history. But this mostly positive uh, public portrayal lasted for many years because Skulk Buerta particularly managed the image of the Ditzer Kinderfonds. For example, in 1978, Buerta agreed to a series of radio broadcasts commemorating the 30th anniversary of the arrival of the children, but he made it very clear to the producer that only positive stories and experiences should be included. But in 1948, 40 years late after the, the mission, this positive portrayal began to unravel somewhat. And the reason was that one of the children, Werner van der Merwe, who was now a professor of history based at UNISA, published a book based on the Ditsa Kinderfonds archive in which a very different picture emerged of the mission. He was very critical of it, and I will mention just a few examples. First, he showed, as he put it, without fear of contradiction, that the real reason for the entire project was not humanitarian aid. The Ditsa Kinderfonds saw this mission as an opportunity to inject fresh, fresh master race blood into the Africana folk in order to ensure the survival and domination of the Africana in South Africa. In short, he said, the mission was tainted by its racist agenda from the beginning. In his book, Van der Merwe also sheds light on the traumatic experiences that many of the children underwent. I mentioned earlier that uh, D.F. Malan adopted one of the children. In her doctoral thesis, Lindy Korf tells how Dr. Malan's childless wife had been promised her pick of the children if D.F. Malan acted as patron to the Ditsa Kinderfonds. Mrs. Malan was waiting on the quayside when the Winchester Castle docked there, and she had first pick of the children. A little girl caught her eye. She described that moment as if she gave spiritual birth to this child, but for the little girl, it was anything but spiritual. She had to be parted from her brother in order 
that the patron of the Ditze Kinderfonds could adopt her. Werner van der Merwe himself was handpicked by a friend of Dr. Vera Birman. And as they grew older, many children began to investigate their German roots. Some discovered that they had been lied to. Their parents were not dead as they had been told. They found that they did indeed have family in Germany, although they had been told that they did not. Many went to Germany in search of family. For some, this ended well. Others experienced further trauma from rejection and resentment. And at, a, at about the same time that van der Merwe's book came out in the late 1980s, Max Dupree's Freya Wirkblatt printed allegations that General Lothar Nietling was implicated in apartheid dirty tricks. Now, Lothar Nietling was one of the 13 year olds that had come out in 1948. He was a, an accomplished scientist and he became head of the South African Police's forensic laboratory. And it was in this capacity that he allegedly provided poison to anti apartheid. Um, to, to apartheid era assassins to use against anti-apartheid activists. Of course, he sued the newspaper for libel and he won the case on appeal forcing its closure. Um, and in many of these reports in the late 80s, reference was made to the 1948 mission um, and his so-called Nazi past was very often mentioned in these reports, as was the name of Skalkboerte and Dr. Vera Birman. So for 40 years, the positive spin remained intact, but it began to unravel in the 1980s with the publication of Werner van der Merwe's book and Lothar Nietling's trial, amongst other things. So when Manton Hurst spoke of Vera Birman's Osovar Brandwach and nationalistic Afrikaner connections, it sounded somehow tame, innocuous, not terribly important. But as I discovered, it was anything but. Beginning in the 1940s and continuing for many decades thereafter, Dr. Birman was associated with radical elements of the Afrikaner right. You know, today, when you speak of someone having been an Afrikaner nationalist, many people think of the National Party. But back in the 1940s, even the National Party distanced itself from the radical Osava Brandwach. Dr. Wehrmann was intricate, integrally linked with these two extreme right-wing organizations. And once I had established these facts, incontrovertible facts, it became clear to me that I could not focus on her many late life achievements as I had originally intended until I answered one fundamental question. And that was, did Dr. Vera Birman transcend these deeply held political views as many have claimed that she did? That became the focus of the rest of my dissertation. And I will very briefly recount my results. Or, or my findings. Much of the narrative of Dr. Bir Dr. Birman's transcendence of her political past derives from her cross-cultural research. In 1975, as I've indicated, she became involved through a student uh, who was investigating the work of some traditional healers and he needed the input of a psychiatrist. She agreed to help him thinking it would only be a one-time thing. Um, in many of her writings, though, she claims that when the healer at the very first ceremony that she attended remarked that he could not heal his patients if they did not dream, her curiosity as a Jungian was piqued. And that was the start of what became a decade-long research project focused primarily on the work of Mr. Mongezi Tiso in a remote part of what was then the Siskai. And out of that research project flowed a very steady stream of publications, books, book chapters rather, a monograph and uh, journal articles and lectures both at home and abroad. Uh, in 1948, her monograph titled Living in Two Worlds appeared to acclaim locally and internationally. So it was to this body of work and to her own archive that I turned in the hope of finding evidence that she had gone undergone the political transformation, the political volt fast that uh, is attributed to her. 
by applying what is sometimes called close reading, but which I prefer to think of as forensic research, I worked my way systematically through every published and unpublished piece of writing I could lay my hands on by her or about her. I knew that I was not going to find some flashing billboard that gave me the answers I was seeking. The nature of archival research and close textual reading is that one has to piece together traces, indications, suggestions that point one way or another. And so as I read through this body of work, both the published and the archival materials, uh, I was looking for indications that would point to a disavowal of the extremist views she once held, traces of a more progressive orientation, traces that might indicate that she was willing to step outside the establishment as it was then uh, and truly embrace otherness as Hearst had suggested. Believe me when I say I was truly hoping to find enough such traces on which to build a case to establish that she had transcended her early life racial politics. But to put it bluntly, I did not find such traces. I did find traces that those early political views um, remained, that she did not undergo a Damascus Road type transcendent experience, and albeit in perhaps a more muted form than in the tumultuous 1940s, elements of those deeply held political ideologies remained and bubbled up periodically. Time doesn't permit me to go into great detail, but let me address a few salient examples. Uh, in terms of her 1984 monograph, my engagement with it revealed to me a short descriptive rather than analytical book that is aimed at the non-specialist. There's very little reliance upon anthropo anthropological literature, even though by the time the book appeared, there were several classics um, that dealt with the very same topic that she was researching that she could have accessed. Uh, the book is cast as a personal discovery of an other world. It reflects on the possibility that this kind of cross-cultural communication could facilitate a better understanding between blacks and whites in South Africa. But such sentiments are undermined by the fact that her work is premised on an underlying theory of racial essence and racial difference. As many critics have pointed out, she generalizes from one cause of healing school to black people generally, to African culture, and even to African civilization. And an essentialized ideology of difference runs through the text. The two worlds in the title of her book are the Western world, which is primarily scientific, and the world of the black healer and his people, which is primarily intuitive, non-rational or oriented towards the inner worlds of symbols and images of the collective unconscious. <clears throat> the book thus echoes an older version of apartheid which stressed respect for polarized cultural differences. I have no doubt that Vera was, had a warm and respectful uh, relationship with Mr. Tiso and her interpreters, but there is no escaping the conclusion that the framework within which she ultimately made sense of these interactions was the essentialized language of racial difference that she had learned in her childhood and that had been reinforced, I think, through her political associations with the Osova Brandwach and the Ditzer Kinderfonds from the 1940s. Let me quickly give you some examples of archival traces. Now, a sizable collection of old medical pocket books, uh, diaries, form part of the Vera Birman collection at UCT Libraries, and these contain field notes of her work with the Tissos. But there are passages in these very same notebooks that call into question the perception that Dr. Vera Birman had undergone the kind of political transformation that some claimed she did. The diaries are not only a record of a research process, they also contain ruminations and reflections that were private, that were never intended to be put into a book or an article. Some of these reveal the extent of her ambivalence towards the Tissos and towards Black people in general, and even about Jews 
Black people are described as childlike, uncivilized, immoral, not as an industrious as whites, lazy. They will ruin the cis guy. They have no sense of time and so on. These are all well-worn racial stereotypes that crop up in some of her more private ruminations and reflections in these pocketbooks. Perhaps the most illustrative of these is found in a section where she describes the event at a celebration of Suskai's independence, where she was an honored guest. Having described a scene that was colorful but chaotic, she writes, and I quote, time is of no consequence. Most boring talk by chief headman of area lasting indefinitely. Seems obsessed with uniforms of all kind. Crowd became restive, but he was oblivious to it. A few people among the organizers tried their very best, but made little impression. How are they going to run an organized society? End quote. How are they going to run an organized society, she asked, echoing the common trope that black people are incompetent and that when they are given independence, they will mess things up. Time does not permit me to go into all of the archival traces, but what I did not find was evidence to support the notion of a radical transformation in racial politics. Finally, I want to touch on one other trace I found. Um, in the late 1970s and 1980s, Dr. Virman published eight articles in the London-based Journal of Analytical Psychology. Now, the disturbing part of this was not the content of the articles, but the metadata. <coughs> Excuse me. In the section uh, that gives details of the contributors, several issues contain words to the effect that she had grown up amongst an African tribe. Now, the complexities of the word tribe aside, um, this is simply not true. Vera did not spend her early years among a tribe of any description. She grew up on a farm on which there were black people, true, but they were servants. She grew up on a farm where some of those servants may have been Urlams, detribalized descendants of black children used as laborers under the euphemistically termed Nbukalung or apprenticeship system, which her grandfather who established the family farm in 1865 is known to have exploited for his own ends. He reportedly owned many child slaves and approved the practice of trading in them. Historian Charles van Onselen and others have shown that the race relations that existed on white owned farms, particularly in the Transvaal during the early parts of the 20th century was characterized by patriarchal paternalism, often involving violence or the threat of violence. So any early cross-cultural socialization that may have happened between white and black children on a farm as often did, um, very soon gave way to entrenched social and, and, and racial hierarchies being activated as the children grew older. Now in my thesis, I speculated somewhat about why she may have airbrushed her past in this manner, but time does not permit me really to go into such detail at this point. It was just noticeable that particularly with uh, overseas audiences, there was this attempt to suggest perhaps that she had had a closer and more equal kind of relationship from the time with black people from the time that she was a young child. Now, when doctors Wendy Fuchel and Rene Nissen interviewed Professor Gillis and he alluded to Vera Birman and the German children, they did not know exactly what he meant. They knew only that Dr. Birman was a respected child psychiatrist who was credited with many pioneering firsts and that she had been honored by UCT with an honorary degree. They had a vague notion that she had worked with orphans in Germany. This much they had learned from a plaque that accompanies a portrait of Dr. Birman in their offices. They did not know about her decades long involvement with the Osava Brandwach or the nature of that organization. They were unaware of the grandiose racially motivated, 
motivated child adoption scheme that Dr. Vera Birman actively facilitated when she placed her medical knowledge at the disposal of the Ditzer Kinderfonds. They were not aware that she had gone to Germany voluntarily to select children, brought them out to South Africa, often split them up, placed them with like-minded Afrikaner nationalists who raised them to be loyal and true Afrikaners who would help to ensure the domination of the Afrikaner nation in South Africa. They were unaware of such details, but when they became aware, they asked the question, does it matter? Quite apart from my academic project, in the real world where people live and move and have their being, does this particular history matter? In conclusion, then, let me say that I'm fully aware that the constraints of a master's level dissertation are such that many avenues of research into the life and work of Dr. Vera Birman remain open. In addition, I adopted one particular line of inquiry, that of a biographer telling a story grounded in as much historical detail as I could find. All biography is an awkward undertaking, as Nancy Jacob and Andrew Bank recently pointed out. I set out wanting to tell one story, but the nature of the records I consulted took me in a different direction. I ended up asking one question, and I try to answer that question as honestly as I could. I'm aware that many people will find my answers unsatisfactory. Other questions can and should be asked. That is the nature of the academic project. And I sincerely hope that what I have shared here today from my own research and my own writing will contribute to furthering that project. Thank you. Right, thank you, Andre, for your for your presentation. Uh, could could I ask Carol, who's not to switch off the camera? Uh, Carol, who's not just waiting for you to switch off your camera, please. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Andre, for that uh, for that presentation. We'll open the floor up for questions. So just remember, in the housekeeping rules at the beginning, I asked you to send all of your questions via the uh, via via the chat. Um, I I want to start off and kick off with a with a, with a question from my from myself. So I'm encouraging um, the audience to just continue to send your your questions via the chat. Uh, I want to start off and ask you, Andre, just the last statement that you made. Does this history matter? And, and how does it connect to our present day functioning? Yeah. Uh, from my perspective, um, what struck me once I had got to speak to Wendy and to Renee and uh, had the opportunity, for example, to do a, a similar sort of presentation um, at the, the department where they were working. It struck me how many people who work within the general field um, that Dr. Vera Birman worked in uh, were very differently affected by the story. And you know, it's, it's not a common story. I mean, not many people know this particular history. And it struck me as time has gone on how different people have reacted when they find out the general gist of the story. And it struck me that many people who work in that domain um, had undergone various experiences, life experiences, if you like, uh, that were shaped by some of the things that um, someone who had been part of the establishment, uh, as I've described, have affected their life experiences. So what was for me an academic exercise, I realized for many other people had very real, uh, real life 
consequences and um, ramifications and evoked certain responses within them, which made me realize that, yeah, some, you know, uh, th this sort of history perhaps does matter far more outside of the academic context than, than one, one might realize. Um, and that struck me as, as important. Uh, yeah. and, and that makes me, um, how can I put this, uh, willing to share the story, even though it may not be a very comfortable one in certain situations, um, in order that this conversation can be taken forward and that those people who have had life experiences that are affected by, by this kind of history have the opportunity to voice that. Thanks, Andre. I, I want to follow up with the, with the, second, uh, with the second question. I, I think a dilemma that is playing in my mind and might be in many other people's mind, which is this idea of the reconciliation of identities. Um, so you you have given a presentation of uh, uh, you know sort of Vera, um, which describes her sort of involvement in the various organisation that she was attached to. Then there's Vera, the um, academic, you know, Vera, the, um, the 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 with the professional, you know, sort of identity. Uh, who's responsible for bringing Jungian, for staff, for founding that sort of Jungian analytic society in South Africa, um, being credited with studying child psychiatry in the, in the province. How does that reconciliation work, or is that an impossible task? Where, where does her identity lie? Yeah. That, it's, that's a difficult question to answer, mm -hmm. um, because as I say, you know, I was investigating one particular avenue and the question remains whether somebody's earlier life necessarily taints later life uh, in terms of positions held and so on. Um, it's a question one asks on many levels, you know. Uh, do I continue to watch the movies of Bill Cosby or so on, uh, you know, to use a, a simple example. Um, I think the, the difficulty is in how I was trying to approach this was to say, what evidence is there to suggest to me that this person um, who was very clearly involved in extreme uh, radical Afrikaner nationalism, um, shed that skin over the years. Um, and I recognize perhaps that the form of, um, shall we say, apartheid era establishment racism uh, was not quite as vitriolic or as vehement as might have been found in the Osovar Brandvach. Um, but I was looking for an evidence, for evidence that suggested that she disavowed, uh, for example, the racist element of the Ditsa Kinderfonds mission, uh, that she disavowed the extreme blood purity type obsessed ideology of the Osava Brandvach. Now that kind of evidence I simply did not find. Uh, and as I say, I found these, these elements, these traces, these suggestions, in her writings, the private writings, particularly the archival stuff that no one has ever really accessed before, uh, that suggests that some of that remained and it bubbles up, it, it, it comes up from time to time in these um, very stereotypical uh, portrayals that I found in, in her writing. So this is what I'm trying to say with the idea that there are many questions that can and should still be asked, you know. Um, she was clearly an unusual woman, a, a remarkable woman. And I think many of the people who would have known her in uh, later life would be astounded at what I'm suggesting, you know, because she was clearly a strong, independent, empathetic person, who did a lot of good in many areas and did, and did achieve a great deal. So those are the sort of inherent contradictions within the people, the paradoxes that one has to try and assimilate and try and work with uh, going forward. Yeah, 
So just just uh, touching on on that, you know. So um, is is it up to the individual, you know, to then say? Because the question is, all all the activities that you talk about where she did good, could that not be seen as her, you know, sort of taking the Damascus road? Well. I think that I think many people do take that approach, you know, um, some of the people who have responded to um, the story uh, have said it doesn't matter, you know, in her later life, she became somebody somewhat different and that that earlier past doesn't matter. Um, it is up to the individual to interpret the story and to interpret whether her late life achievements were in any way nullified by the earlier history um, questions can be asked about whether the honorary doctorate that she received was justified given her previous history those are the sort of questions individual people are asking um, so i think yeah you're right in the sense or, or the individual is going to make up their mind one way or another um, Within the broader field of biographical writing, one sees the sort of trend. Uh, you know, there was a, a time when people didn't want to write biographies of Afrikaner nationalist uh, leaders, like, say, D.F. Malan, whom I mentioned in my presentation. But over time, there's been a sort of trend to write more, shall we say, sympathetic biographies, saying these were people of their time, they did this because of the times they were living in. And, and that doesn't really matter so much when you consider other factors. So that's up to the individual, I think, to make up their minds about the degree uh, to which they were people of their time and they reflected those attitudes and that doesn't really matter as one goes forward. That's very much an individual decision, I think. So I, I, I want to ask another another question in terms of uh, because this history has permeated uh, decades and to some extent still exists uh, in present day. And just a reflection in terms of like wh what keeps that alive? What what keeps that idea? you know, sort of, of, um, of the Vieira that you've presented alive? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, so maybe where there are, there, there are responsibilities on, on uh, because institutions and individuals carry the history. You know. And there's yes. a comment that that I that I wrote down earlier in terms of um, checkpoints in society that would ordinarily scrutinize uh, these types of histories. And we know that in in early history, those checkpoints were were sort of never never there, you know. And this might, you know, sort of be the thing that's uh, contributed to this uh, history. Transcending, you know, kind of different uh, different decades. Yeah, look, I, I think in some ways, you know, the, the the late life accomplishments have become the um, the focus, and so a legacy gets institutionalized. It gets trans uh, translated. You know, how can I put this? Um, Vera herself did not create the mythology that surrounds her. That mythology was built up following her death. And it's, it's, it's intriguing because, you know, she died in 1998, just four years after the official end of apartheid. And the, the kind of mythology that grew up seems to have gained momentum from then. So it was kind of uh, a way of legitimizing or, or appropriating the apartheid ending the the 1994 moment uh, and from then on the mythology starts to sort of gather and uh, I mean I found passages for example that said that the Southern African Association for Jungian Analysts uh, in some way was 
responsible for the peaceful transition to democracy in South Africa. I mean, it got to that sort of point. Um, so this mythology appropriated, I think, the, the political zeitgeist, the, the, the 1994 moment, and the idea that this person who had been involved in a pioneering sort of uh, transcultural project um, became imbued with attributes to lend credibility to that in terms of what was going on politically from 1994 on. And so the mythology grows until it is, as uh, one writer said, uh, not only did she study um, with Mr. Tiso, but she actually became a healer herself in the African tradition. So that's the kind of growth of the mythology that takes place. And that's what keeps this kind of thing hidden uh, because the mythology gets focused on um, and gets perpetuated uh, in writings. And when you go back, you see, you know, the contradictions in the mythology or the inherent problems within it. So I think, I hope that answers your question somewhat. Yeah, thank, thank you for that. I want to take just one uh, question from uh, the chat room. Tessa Ross asks, in light of ideas about family, did she have any children of herself? Uh, are there any surviving uh, members uh, of the family to interview? Um, Vera herself got married in the late 1930s, but did not have any children of her own, um, no biological children. Uh, in terms of, you know, so there's no direct descendants from Vera, there are other family members, and I did have the opportunity informally to speak to some of them uh, during the course of my investigation. So no, she did not have any biological children. Could you also give a, a comment just in terms of her early upbringing, uh, just a comment on her family? Okay, um, yeah, it's a very, very interesting family. It begins with the arrival in 18, I think it was 1848, somewhere around there, of the, her grandfather, who uh, was the stumfather of the Birmans in South Africa. And he established a farm just outside Ermilo in 1865 called De Emigrati. And that is, I think, still to this day in the Birman family. Um, she was born in 1910 um, as a bit of what we would call a lark lamiki. Her parents, her father was uh, very involved in the South African War, the, the Anglo Boer War of 1899 to 1902. Her mother spent some time in a concentration camp along with some of her older siblings. And, um, you know, these, if you know anything of the Africana uh, nationalistic struggle, the images from the Boer War uh, were very, very strongly used by Africana cultural entrepreneurs to shape uh, Africana nationalism. And there's no doubt that Vera's family were particularly patriotic. They, all of them, um, were involved in one degree or another. Her brother Willem, for example, uh, I, I found a letter in the National Archives uh, when he was still a teenager at school, he wrote to his father a letter saying, would his father please support him to go to America to study economics because he doesn't understand how the Afrikaner is so economically subject or, or suppressed. Why is it that it is only Jews who own shops, that sort of thing? So he was very precociously concerned with the Afrikaner's economic uh, well-being. And in fact, he spent 10 years in America, came back, was very instrumental in, institu in, in his establishing institutions like Volkskas um, and many, many other Afrikaner organizations. So her background on a farm uh, in a... Uh, super patriotic, if you like, family. And uh, all of her siblings, to one degree or another, shared that kind of patriotism, that kind of Africana nationalistic spirit. And it was in the 1930s that she uh, linked herself to these extreme right organizations. Um, there's evidence that most of her brothers were part of the Osava Brandwach or the New Order, Oswald Piro's New Order. Um, and so on. Uh, uh, yeah, she grew up as a, a typically uh, hyper patriotic Afrikaner nationalist 
on a, on a farm in the Eastern Transvaal as it was then. So it's very difficult to sort of um, sum up her, her, her background in just one or two minutes, but yeah, that's the kind of, of background she came from. Very interesting family. Yeah. So I want to extend a, a thanks to you, Andre, for your, for your presentation. Uh, very fascinating. Uh, we're going to move on to our, our next speaker, which is uh, Astrid, who will provide a response to, to Mr. Langman's thesis. Thank you uh, very much, uh, John. I would like to read my paper by sharing um, the screen. So, I am grateful to Rod Anderson for his constructive and helpful input towards this presentation. I also acknowledge my colleagues from Sarja, Stephen Bloch and Ian Donald, who shared their views, as well as Professor Robert Schweitzer from Queensland University, Australia, and Professor Noxola Mdende from the Nelson Mandela University in the Eastern Cape. As we've heard, Vera Buman was born shortly after the Boer War, with its consequent devastation to the Afrikaner peoples. There is no doubt that she was deeply and unavoidably embedded in Africana history and some of its, more pro its problematic nationalistic manifestations. The conclusion of this thesis is that this history shaped her to such an extent that she remained unchanged throughout her lifetime, that she was untransformed and racist. The author traces what he feels to be a problematic, toxic confluence of influences underpinning Vera's work and achievements. The thesis ends with a profound condemnation of her life, work and character. This cannot go unchallenged. And there are multiple problematic areas, a few of which will be addressed here. Unfortunately, the time limit does not allow for more. Underpinning very many of the arguments made are the constructs of presentism, reductionism, and a negative interpretation bias. Presentism means evaluating the past in terms of current frames of mind. We have to remember that the TRC was established in 1996 and Vera died two years later. She was deep in her 80s when the apartheid atrocities came to light in the public domain. What we have come to learn since then, and our consciousness collectively of racism, stereotyping and prejudice has increased enormously. And we have become aware of the pain and become more reflective in how we speak and write. It is unfair to see and judge a person of those times using the lens of the present time. Vera was and remained an Afrikaner of her time. There is no doubt about that. But there is no overwhelming evidence that she harbored right-wing ideologies in her later years. It is quite a leap. A myopic reductionism runs throughout the thesis without considering the possibility that alternative interpretations might equally be valid. One of the hallmarks of scholarly and qualitative investigation is self-reflexivity. That is the acknowledgement of bias and the subjectivity of the researcher. Very little can be found in this work. Instead, categorical statements are frequently made where a more reflective stance would be called for. Throughout the thesis, there's a tendency to appraise situations and quotations in a way that cast Vera as a racist or opportunist. For example, why the negative interpretation of chance and accidental events in shaping the direction her life took? Many a great discovery was made by chance and isn't much of what we do because of chance. Let me focus on two aspects of Vera's life that were described in the thesis where these constructs are evident. 
the Dietze Kinderfonds. Vera Bierman's prolonged dedication to the DKF is said to have arisen simply from her loyalty to this racist agenda. Undoubtedly, there were ethical issues that she might not have seen or anticipated at the time. I do know that she deeply regretted having agreed to participate in this project and had stated tearfully many years afterwards that she would never do this again. Today, of course, we would not consider such a project as we know better, thanks to attachment theory. But let us go back and look at the context of those times. Firstly, at that time, it was not regarded as an unusual or cruel practice to quote, rescue orphan children and relocate them in another country. In fact, in the 1880s, child immigration became a coordinated mass movement. It served the purpose of British empire building and public concern about child poverty. So by the mid 1920s, nearly 87,000 boys and girls had been sent to Canada. And there were a number of selection criteria here too. The children were evaluated by a social worker. They had to participate in an oral examination in front of a panel and had to have high IQ scores. Selection was thus very much part of the process at the time and it only stopped in the 1970s. It was not something that only the DKF asked for and practiced. Another example, in 1921, Isaac Ochberg rescued 197 Jewish orphans from Eastern Europe and brought them to South Africa with the help of the local Jewish community. And reading that story, one can find many parallels between these two stories. Thus, considering war children in need of care for translocation into families in South Africa was not so out of the ordinary at the time. It also has to be added that the young smuts, that young smuts of the South African government approved it and even paid for the journey. So it was not just an Africana DKF venture. Secondly, on a more personal level, Vera was asked by her older brother, Willem, to be the doctor in the team that would examine and assess the children. In Afrikaner culture, as in many other cultures, the younger sister will not easily or readily oppose the wishes of her older brother, particularly if the family had gone to great lengths to support her medical studies. In other words, we cannot know how much of a personal choice Vera had in participating in this project. Thirdly, on a psychodynamic level, could this have been an act of gratitude, albeit unconscious, that she cheated death so often that she was meant to survive to fulfill a higher person, purpose, that of reducing suffering? She kept her connection with the DKF to see this undertaking through. That is, until these children were adults. She was not going to relinquish her responsibility towards them. This was a clinical medical responsibility and may have had nothing to do with ongoing support for the ideology of the DKF. Add to this the fact that the DKF was placed under a governmental obligation that they would provide support for children until they reach the age of maturity, she was actually legally bound to remain involved. Is there thus sufficient evidence to suggest that she remained true to the tradition of right-wing Africana ideology, or is it rather that she remained true to the children she felt responsible for? The second part of her work that I want to go into a little bit is her transcultural work. This is particularly close to my heart, and it is puzzling that in this thesis, the body and content of her work has not been given more attention. Given that in today's South Africa, where integrating traditional healing into mental health care is receiving so much attention. 
In the thesis, her work is diminished and even dismissed. And the argument is made that this was simply a camouflage for her racist attitudes. This is not only deeply offending for me on a personal affective level, but it is neither borne out by facts nor by my clinical experience. Vera never claimed to be an anthropologist and she did not do her research according to that discipline. She was a psychotherapist and wanted to experience and understand how traditional healers treated their patients. Learning from experience is the most profound way of acquiring real knowledge and understanding. She is being blamed for not engaging with anthropo anthropological literature. Why should she have done so with white, probably colonial academics? She wanted to experience the healing rituals herself with an open mind and not be dictated to or influenced by people who came at the subject from a different perspective. Her objective was to establish communication with the healers and their patients. And at that, she was exceptional. A quote from Professor Robert Schweitzer, who was the person who introduced Vera to the transcultural work and who lived and worked with her in the field for many weeks and months. I think that this was Vera's real strength. That is an immediate connection with the people who formed the field work. And she was unreservedly respected by all. He continues, remember that the work we did followed publications by people like Globescher, who described healers as psychopaths and psychotic, and even Hammond Took, the anthropologist, again, whose work I respect, but talked about healers being homosexual. Vera brought a new lens to this understanding and deserves credit for this. What is important is whether her findings were, were or are a true reflection of the forms and content of traditional healing rituals in that part of the Eastern Cape. It would have been far more helpful and respectful of indigenous practices if the author of the thesis had consulted with present day traditional healers and asked them for their opinion on various findings. Instead, white academics are quoted, many of whom probably never attended a traditional ceremony. Here, I want to bring in my experience. I have worked with parents and infants in a predominantly Isitosa speaking community, where many of the parents had their family homes in rural Eastern Cape. In the course of many years of psychological, psychiatric consultations, I familiarized myself with indigenous healing practices. I met with local healers and I participated in traditional ceremonies. Nothing like Vera did, as I never went into rural homesteads, but rather by invitation of my colleague to family rituals in the community. What I experienced there corresponded very closely with what Vera described and I cross-checked frequently with traditional healers and other Tosa people I knew about various aspects of the ceremonies. Without exception, they confirmed Vera's findings. I have also known and worked with Professor Nogzola Mdenda over 20 years. Besides being a senior indigenous nationally known healer, she is an adjunct professor at Nelson Mandela University in the Department of Anthropology and has recently been appointed by national government to chair the ad hoc panel that is to make recommendations to the president on a traditional matter pertaining to the Amakosa people. She and I co-authored a postscript to the reprint of Vera's book, Living in Two Worlds in 2007. And I quote what she wrote. It will be evident when reading this book that Dr. Burman may have been one of the first researchers from the West to truly respect the people she was researching. 
she did not come with preconceived conclusions as her predecessors did. She was also aware that language carries the culture of the people and was fully aware that there are terms that are untranslatable. She therefore did not try to impose her own terminologies on the indigenous language. Her use of Isitosa terms like Inklombe, Ukutrensa, Ukutwaza, Ubulau, shows she had realized that this cannot be translated into English equivalents. It is also appreciated that she never used terms like witch doctors when referring to the Amakricha as was the norm in the past. In addition to what this prominent present day expert has to say, do we really think that an experienced healer like Mr. Tisu was, as well as Vera's interpreter, who kept contact with her until her death, would have continued working with her if they felt she was not authentic and honest in her desire to meet and understand the practices of the people she met in the Eastern Cape, that she was engaging with them for opportunistic or narcissistic reasons. We should not underestimate or presume to know better than Mr. Tiso. What he said to the visitors about Vera's presence is significant. Quote, if you ever find her on the road in difficulties, I request you to help her to improve relations between black and white. Why is this statement not given more weight? It is being diminished as Mongezu Tiso's patronage, a profoundly disrespectful attitude. It is not possible on any level to accept the conclusion that Vera's work with Mr. Tiso's group was merely a peg on which to hang her Jungian hat. Driven by his determination to illustrate Vera Buhlmann's lack of transformation, the author slides over monumental achievements very few of us could emulate. The Child and Family Unit and its evolution into the Division of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, which for 30 years after her retirement, from there was a desired place of work and study, its achievements, innovations, including first recognized training in child and adolescent psychiatry and the establishment of a parent infant mental health service. She developed the field of autism and brought understanding and compassion for children of this order. She established the first South African analytic training society. She left a substantial fund, and this is not generally known, dedicated to providing psychotherapy for people previously disadvantaged, with the hope that these would become analysts in time. That Sarja has no black analysts has nothing to do with Vera, but other factors that require a completely different conversation. On an individual level, there are many persons here and abroad that are deeply grateful to her for, for what she has enabled them to do with their lives. Their views, including my own, are simply brushed aside in this thesis and regarded as false. Nothing of this so obvious bias is acknowledged, and it is as if the author can only perceive a malevolent thread permeating all that Vera Buhmann thought or accomplished. Although Vera's expressions of personal regret are acknowledged in the thesis, this is regarded as insufficient as it is not the same as a public disavowal. Here, Vera Buhmann is negatively contrasted to Brown Fisher, Bayers Nodia, and others. Now, Vera was a woman. She was an introverted person. She came from a very different family background to these white men who at the time were in dominant positions and occupied public positions. And we are not all the same, nor can we assume that we know what went on in her mind. It seems in this author's view that without a grand gesture of apology, nothing else Vera Buhlmann said or did seems enough to demonstrate any change or moderation in her position, not even years 
spent doing cross-cultural work during the high height of apartheid. Indeed, the whole of this work, which was an attempt to build bridges, is discredited. This thesis fails to acknowledge the possibility that much of Vera Beaumont's work in later life reflects a lifetime of conscious and unconscious acts of reparation, much of which is often a silent activity. The thesis fails to make room for this possibility in its relentless intent to see only malevolence in action. The author would have been better served if he had taken some informed input from persons well-versed in analytical psychology, as well as the history of psychoanalysis, instead of relying on one-sided critical visions of Jung. There are many issues that could be taken up in regard to this point, but time does not allow for this. But one point that cannot go unsaid is the author's dismissal of Jungian psychology as having a racist core. This is both ill-informed as well as profoundly prejudicial. It is evidence of a negative prejudgment that allow, allows for no other competing interpretation. In doing so, it is extremely problematic. Overall, this thesis feels to be a significantly unbalanced and ungenerous interpretation of Vera Beaumont's life, her achievement, and her character. And let me end with the words of Nuxola Mdenda. When I told her about the symposium, she said, and I have her permission to quote her. Why don't you guys arrange a public debate on these allegations where we can expose the real racists with facts on the issue, not Vera? The fact that Vera speaks of two worlds is an acknowledgement and recognition of the other world. I hope that we follow her injunction and I thank you. I want to thank you, Astrid, for your, for your contributions. Uh, just before I go to the questions, uh, uh, so I ask the participants to look on the chat. At uh, 10.45, you are asked to click on the new link, uh, which will take you to, uh, to the meeting that allows us to hold a lot more participants. Yeah. So I, I have an, an, an interesting question. So as many of you know, I work at, uh, at the division that Vera um, founded at DCAP. And when starting there, you know, you could hear these remarkable stories about the work that Vera, um, that Vera had, had done, because I'd never, I'd never met her. And I know that Astrid, you 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 had um, you know sort of personal engagements uh, you know sort of with her. And I wanted to just get your contributions in terms of who who was Vera the person. Uh, Vera was, as I said in what I said, an introverted person. She played her, if you want to use the metaphor, she played her cards always close to her chest. She, she did not easily um, talk about her own feelings. Um, uh, she was acutely, um, she was very intuitive, very observant, and would say one or two things that, that would stay with you. So, for example, I was a registrar and she supervised me and I was, I was, getting quite excited about doing sort of research, like uh, uh, um, scientific uh, 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 psychiatric research. And she looked at me, um, research with big numbers, and she looked at me and she just said one day to me, well, Astrid, in the end, it's the individual that counts. And that just stayed with me. And that put me on the path of, yes, actually, she's right. And that put me on the path of first doing analysis before going into any research. So there are those, those moments that I think many, many of us have in remembering her saying something very simply, but it, it, it sort of changed. I was at a crossroads. I could have gone into research or I could have gone into analysis. And when she said, but it's the, in, in the end, it's the individual that counts has stayed with me forever. And there are many examples like that I can give. And I know of many people in the world who can give examples like that. 
Okay, thank you, Astrid, for sharing that. I'm, I'm going to take a question from the from the chat room from Simpiwe Simelani. Did Professor Mdende have access to the personal writings that showed some of her deeply held beliefs when she wrote that statement? Uh, I still find it problematic that it seems like her work was uh, needed to legitimize, acknowledge the work of traditional healers. Sorry, can, was, like, uh, I mean, uh, whether uh, uh, Professor Mlenda was aware of the personal statements, uh, no, I mean, she, she hadn't, yeah. no. No, no, she, she, she was aware of, uh, she had uh, be, had read Vera's book. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, not to my knowledge, she may have, but not to my knowledge. Okay. Yeah. And um, so I, I wanna ask you this, this question, in terms of the, the, the cross-cultural work that Vera did, how, how much do you think power dynamics played in the interactions she had um, with the communities that she researched or the people that she worked with? I don't know, that's a question. I don't know if he's managed to come along that you would have to ask Robert Schweitzer because he was with her. And from what he said to me, it, uh, that doesn't uh, doesn't play a feature at all. He he said she, it, it it was remarkable how the how how openly people communicated with her. And um, you see, we uh, I, I don't I can't say, it, but but he definitely uh, uh, didn't. And I never had the sense of of power dynamics. It's it's a uh, something one needs to think about. Um, and I can't say, and it, but Mr. Tisu was such a strong healer. I, I cannot imagine him submitting because she was a white woman. I, I, I just cannot imagine that. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just one last uh, comment from um, Bennett uh, Van Roof. Uh, who writes, uh, sorry for mispronouncing your surname, 1948 was three years after the liberation of the death camps um, at uh, Eitrich. Uh, uh, by 1948, it was well known that the Nazis had murdered six million Jews, millions of Slavic people, hundreds and thousands of Roma uh, uh, people, etc. As a result of the racial uh, theories, Vieira was a mature woman of 38 when she joined an expedition to identify Aryan children who could strengthen their Africana bloodline. It is hard to believe that she was unaware of the results of Nazis' uh, racial ideology. Um, her failure to dissociate herself from this project for more than 20 years says something about her views. So, I mean, that, that comment leads to this tension that, that I, I, I posed. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. I, I mean, as I said, I, I, I witnessed her personal regret about this whole project. Um, but I do think, you know, we must be really be careful because she didn't make a public apology and why she kept involved with those children. She felt clinically responsible for those children. And one of the things about Vera I do want to say is that she was politically naive. I said that at her funeral, and I remember her family being sort of quite upset with me when I said she's politically naive. So she, it would have not crossed her mind to make a big statement about this for the sake of political correctness. She stayed with his children. I am hypothesizing, and from what I know of her, because she was A, legally obliged, but B, also if she had, if she had rubbished this whole project, or not rubbished, or apologized for it, then she would also be apologizing for these young people. She would negate them and what they had become. Uh, it, it's a clinical, medical, ethical dilemma then. Do you stay with your patient or do you move and say the politically correct thing? So I think, I think that's the question that we can't answer. Thank you. Thank you, Astrid. Um, 
So we're, we're, we're coming to the end of your, of your presentation and, and quite a difficult, uh, I think, subject to navigate in terms of reconciling these identities, you know, which in, in some ways both have hold um, quite significant, you know, sort of truths. So I want to thank you for your thank you. availability to participate in this symposium. Yeah. Just again thank to you. ask the... Thank, just Thank you for the space, yeah. yeah. Just again to ask the audience uh, to uh, log out of this, uh, to the link in the, in the chat room, which will take you to the new meeting.